Now at last we come to our first theorem, the kraft macmillan inequality, which gives us an intriguing characterization of uniquely decodable codes and prefix codes. So in this video we're going to state the theorem, but first we need one more bit of terminology. So a b -ary code, b -ary code, for some positive integer b, is a code, of course it's a code, c from our source alphabet X to A star, the set of all strings of symbols from our alphabet A, from our code alphabet A. So a B -ary code is a code, it's just a code, such that the size of A of the code alphabet is B. So this is just the number of elements in that set. Sometimes we might also write it this way. The number of elements in that set, and then this when we use this terminology, we're using the, a finite set A, and B is so B is some positive integer. Okay, so maybe just a brief couple examples just to make this completely clear if it's not already. So if our code alphabet is 0 and 1, if we're doing binary sequences of our encoded messages, then B is 2, and in that case, it would be, well, the way I've written it here, a two array code. Usually we would say binary. Or another example, say A was, I'll make it something different. I don't know, maybe it's, um, maybe it's one, two, three. Then B would be three, and we would have a three array code or a ternary, we'd probably say ternary code. And more generally, when you're using some arbitrary integer, we'll say b -ary. Okay, now with that out of the way, we are ready for the theorem. And the theorem has two parts. Part A is due to Macmillan. And Macmillan says, for any uniquely decodable code, any uniquely decodable b -ary code, uniquely decodable b -ary code, we have the following inequality. The sum over all the elements little x in our source alphabet, script x, of 1 over b to the l of x, L of x is the lengths, is less or equal to 1. So here, L of x is the length of the code word for x under the code C. And B here is the B in B array. So Macmillan says, give me any uniquely decodable B array code, and I guarantee that its lengths satisfy this inequality. So that is part A. And what is part B? Part B is Kraft's part. It's a converse of sorts. Make a little space here. So Kraft says, okay, give me any set of lengths, any function L from our set of source symbols to non-negative integers, 0, 1, 2, and so on. And if your L satisfies the following inequality, the same inequality, sum over X's in our source alphabet, 1 over B to the L of X, less than 1. If your L satisfies that, then there exists a B ary prefix code with those lengths. So let's write that. There exists a b -ary prefix code c such that the length of the code word for x under c equals l of x for every x in our source alphabet. So Macmillan said, give me a uniquely decodable code and I guarantee it satisfies this inequality. Kraft says, give me some set, of, so a, a uniquely decodable code and I guarantee that its lengths satisfy this inequality. And Kraft says, give me any set of lengths. 
that satisfy this inequality, and I will give you a BRE prefix code with those lengths. So note here, he's not just saying he's going to give you a uniquely decodable code. He's saying, indeed, I will give you a prefix code, which is, of course, uniquely decodable, but it's even better. All right, so let's illustrate this with a few examples. So that is the theorem. Let's maybe draw a line. That is the theorem. And now if all goes according to plan, I should be able to cut and paste our famous examples, A and B. And we'll, we'll check the theorem. Check that the theorem actually works for these. So let's do A first. So in A here, what do we have? We need to, so A, we know that this was a uniquely decodable code. In fact, in fact, it is a, a prefix code. And so Macmillan says a uniquely decodable code satisfies the length satisfy this inequality. So let's check that. Let's see if the lengths actually satisfy that. Well, first let's observe B is two where everything's in binary here. And so this sum, maybe just to remind ourselves what it is, that's B to the L, but let's make it, let's go ahead and write two since we know B is two. So what is this? Let's just plug in what this is. So we have to sum over each possible value of x. So we're summing over a, b, c, and d. And the first one is 1 over 2 to the l of a, which is 1 over 2 to the 1, plus 1 over 2 to the l of b, which is 2, plus 1 over 2 to the 3, plus 1 over 2 to the 3. And what is this? 1 half one quarter, uh, one eighth, one eighth. So what do we have? We have uh, one half, three quarters, seven eighths, one. So it is exactly one, which is of course, less or equal to one. And therefore this quantity is less or equal to one. And the inequality is satisfied. Okay, so that's a good sign. That's consistent with the theorem, at least. So let's check B. B is also uniquely decodable. And B equals, well, the example B is uniquely decodable, and the B in our B array code is also two. We're, we're just binary here. And let's plug it in. Well, I guess we don't need to rewrite the definition again we can just go ahead and start computing what is it 1 over 1 over 2 to the L of a is 1 over 2 to the 3 1 over 2 to the L of B is 1 over 2 to the 2 1 over 2 to the 4 1 over 2 to the 1 so we get 1 8th plus 1 4th plus 1 16th plus 1 half and what is this? Let's see. One half plus a quarter is three quarters. Seven eighths plus a sixteenth is fifteen sixteenths. All right. And that is, of course, less or equal to one. And so, indeed, it satisfies the inequality, which is yet another good sign that the theorem is in pretty good shape, at least empirically so far, because this is uniquely decodable. So this example is also consistent with A because we have a uniquely decodable B array code and it ought to satisfy the inequality and indeed it does, less or equal to one. Let's do one more. Let's do our example C from before. I may not remember exactly what it was, but we'll do something like it at least. And we don't need to worry about the probabilities anymore. Well for the moment. So we have the same A, B, C, and D. And our code words were something like this, 0, 1. This one was a non-uniquely decodable code. 0, 1, 0, 1, and 1, 0. So the lengths are 1, 1, 2, 2. And let's plug this in, see what we get. So we have 1 over, again, so B is 2. We have 1 over 2 to the 1. 1 over 2 to the 1, 1 over 2 squared, 1 over 2 squared, 
And yeah, things are not looking very good for this one because this is we're already at one here. So this is one plus one half. So this is one and a half, which is clearly greater than one. And therefore, this does not satisfy the inequality. And that is yet another good sign for the theorem because if it did satisfy the inequality, then Kraft would tell us, so if, if those sets of lengths satisfy the inequality, Kraft says there exists a B area, a binary in this case, prefix code C with those lengths. So if these lengths, 1, 1, 2, 2, satisfy the inequality, there would exist a prefix code with those lengths, but it's fairly obvious that there can exist no such prefix code because, you know, if you have, you're going to have, uh, you know, one of these code words is going to be a prefix of one of these. So that's going to be certainly a problem. Okay, so things are looking good for the theorem, at least empirically so far. And next, we're going to prove it. So we'll do that next. Um, actually, briefly, one other thing to mention here. Here, I just picked b equals 2, and of course, uh, b could have also been 3, for example, in this case, even though we didn't use all, all our code words didn't use all, uh, that didn't use three symbols, b could have been 3. That would be consistent with all the definitions and everything. And if b was 3, then the inequality would still be satisfied, or any higher number, if it, b was even higher than that, the inequality would still be satisfied because these numbers would all have been smaller. And maybe I'll mention one more thing about a little bit the intuition here for the theorem. Earlier when we were looking at the Morse code, way back when we were start, first starting to talk about it, we said, you know, you know, there's only sh so many short code words to go around. You know, you'd like to have short code words on average, but you can't make everything have a short code word because there's only, you know, then you're going to be duplicating or having prefixes and, and something like that. And this inequality characterizes precisely that, that delicate sort of balance between long and short code words. This inequality tells you exactly the, the relationships that these, these lengths have to, the lengths of the code words have to satisfy in order for there to exist a, 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 a code with those code word lengths. If you, if you think about what, what is going on with each of these terms, so if you just look at one of these terms, when L of X is smaller, this term, that, that term is getting bigger. And when L of X is bigger, that term is getting smaller. So small for small code words, you're paying a price. Small code words are eating up a lot of this one. So you can think of it as sort of a, a budget, so to speak. You have a budget of one, and you have to allocate your code words in such a way that you come in under budget or at budget. And so for short code words, you're paying a hefty price because they contribute more to this sum. Whereas for very, for, you know, for longer code words, you, you pay less, they're cheaper in some sense. But you want short code words, so, so you have to sort of strike the balance between long and short. And this is exactly the balance that you have to strike. Okay, so that's the intuition, and next we're gonna prove this theorem, and it has a marvelous little proof.